See how blue that eye is? That's beautiful. And it's more than likely super hypo because you see that the, the, uh, the labby pattern has completely been reduced to a fine line down its back. And you can see the real whites and pinks in this snake. What's up, snake fans? Dave Palumbo here for Muscle Serpents Daily. The sun is coming down. You can see that nice, like, pinkish hue on my face from the... Uh, the clouds diffracting the sun as it's about to set here in Cape Coral, Florida. I got my outdoor enclosures behind me here. We're gonna be looking at some um, snakes that we didn't get to see in yesterday's video. I also filmed some really cool uh, crystal boa today. So today, I guess today is gonna be mostly boa stuff. We're gonna see some Russo red pastel line sterlings. We're gonna see some crystals and some combinations of crystals and anything else that might strike my fancy. A little, a little water monitor stuff too. Uh, we're working on our black dragon and training that as well. So let's, uh, let's go into the snake room, take a look. All right, a little update from the uh, fish tank that I have in my garage here. Man, look at those angels. My angel fish are getting really big. Look at this, that clown loach is nice and big. But my marble angel fish are, have done really, really well. I, I, you know, I don't know if they're, if I have males and females, I have to imagine I have at least one pair out of the three. It would be interesting to see them start breeding. I think I, if there are a pair there, I got to imagine we're going to see some, some breeding action pretty soon. There's my one discus. I'm still on the fence. I want more, but I, uh, I have a surgery coming up, which I'll tell you guys about in, over the next couple weeks. And once I get through that, maybe we'll, uh, we'll add some, some nice white discus to the tank. That's really what I want. But these guys are great. If I clean the tank, the key is water changes. You got to do water changes on the tank. That helps the, the plants grow better. It helps the fish really look better. They, I mean, they're looking really, really nice here. And very healthy. Look at this girl. We love to see that she is just looking, I just told Papa, she's looking juicy big. Sitting on the hot spot. This is what you want to see from your boas. When they just sit on that hot spot and they haven't eaten in a few weeks, they don't want to be bothered. That is a gravid boa. Um, we've seen locks with this girl earlier in the year. So more than likely, we're going to get a nice litter from this girl. Probably she'll be my first boa to go. And that's because, you know, we started her early. I had the mail, I had this mail in with her for several months now. And it doesn't surprise me that she's going to go first. So that's what they look like. Your boas will not sit on the heat like this all day long. Unless they're, unless they're holding babies inside. So we'll keep you updated on this girl. It's a, it's a kind of an exciting um, litter. She's a sharp albino sun glow. So that's a hypo, sharp albino, and she's het for uh, RDR, black-eyed anery, being bred by a arabesque sharp sun glow that's head RDR. So we're gonna get a lot of super hypo blizzards, pretty much this. <laughs> we're gonna be getting these guys right here. <laughs> and we're gonna get arabesque versions of these. I don't know, if we probably won't be able to, in the super hypo forms, if we hit super hypo, we probably won't even see the arabesque because these are blank slates, no pattern. But in the ones that are not, we will see the arabesque in 50% of the babies. So it's exciting. Who doesn't like a white snake with beautiful red eyes, man? This is just, look at it, not a single mark on it. The super fires have black on them. This girl, or this boy, I should say, not a single speck of black anywhere. Look at that, that's pure white. All right, uh, I'm just trying to work with my black water monitor here. My friend Paul Miller dropped off here. And this girl's really beautiful. I showed it to you the other day. You know, I, I was trying to my Kevin McCurley technique. I had my hand in here, just putting it on here. And she actually tried to start coming up to my hand with her tongue flicking. And she was really happy. And, and I, I gotta tell you, I got nervous. I, like I thought she was gonna bite my hand. And I went and I put my glove on. And when I put the glove back here, she 
whipped me, she whipped the glove with the tail. She was really, really, you know, not happy about it. And I think she associates the glove with being grabbed, you know, and, and, and moved, which is probably, I'm sure, how when Paul has to, you know, take her from one cage and put her on another, he probably, you know, uses the glove. And so I'm going to have to just build trust relationship with her where I'm not afraid that she's going to bite my hand if she comes over. You know, I just, I just, you know, haven't worked with her, so I might have to just bite the bullet and, and have trust in her like I want her to have in me. And if she comes over with a tongue flick and just not worry about my hand, because I just don't want her to think my hand is food. And that, that's what I'm afraid of. See, she's coming over now. Is she going to try to bite my hand or is she coming over because she, she wants to investigate? That's the question. I'm just, you know, I don't want to take a bite from a big water monitor. I don't know her that well, but she seems not to be afraid of my hand, but the glove she doesn't like. So I'm going to have to, like I said, it's going to be a two-way street with me building trust with her and then me trusting her not to bite me, you know, and I'm going to have to, at some point, allow her to come over and investigate my hand. I would think that if she was gonna, she thought it was food, she'd come running over and just try to bite it, you know? So she didn't do that at all. There was no aggressive moves on her part. So we're gonna keep doing the hand training and hopefully I can maybe get her to come over and I can rub under her chin or something like that. And then that would be a very, a good positive little thread that we built up between each other, you know? She obviously does not like the glove. So I'm just not gonna be able to do the glove thing with her, I think. See, she's being much more, much calmer without me having the glove here. And I'm just keeping my hand right into the entrance of the cage. And she sees the cage is open. Once again, she was coming over before to kind of investigate me and check it out. And she wasn't really looking aggressive at all. But once again, I, I kind of chickened out, but that's all right. It's only like the second day I've been working with her. And little by little, we have to build trust between the two of us. And that's... The McCurley method, really. I have her in a cage. It's not too big. She really loves her water, her water bowl. I must change. Pablo and I must change this water dish three times a day. She's always jumping in there, and she'll poop in there, and she'll hang out in there, and chill. So, I'm, ultimately, I want to build her a bigger cage, but I really want to try to tame her down a little bit first, where we have a relationship where I, she'll come over, and you know, I can pet her and stuff. Once I do that in a smaller cage, then we'll move her to a bigger cage. And I don't know if that will undo it, but I think at least then she can have, you know, more room to bask and, and move around a little bit more. Uh, a little update on my VPIT positive crystal. That's VPIT positive visual that also is a super labyrinth. So super labby. EPIT positive. We call the Super Labia Crystal Boa. And really, really interesting looking snake. The, the EPIT positive really kind of erased a lot of the um, the labyrinth, or I should say the super labyrinth pattern. Some of the super labbies, you know, without hypo, we'll have a, um, and this does have one copy of hypogene, we'll have some pattern, but it seems like the sun glow version, which is, or the VPIT positive sun glow version, which is hypo VPIT positive, erased a lot of the pattern here. We have just like a very faint yellow pattern here. Genetic powerhouse, however, because this is a visual and I love crystals. I like the idea of a crystal T positive as opposed to a crystal albino, just because Albino is almost too much, like it takes away too much. I think this is kind of a more interesting combination. And obviously it's, it's more, when you breed other things to it, other VPIT positives, everything you're gonna get is gonna be a labyrinth VPIT positive. So that's, that to me, which is, is real, the real power is here. So if I breed this to like a crazy het VPIT positive, I'm gonna get 50% het, het I'm gonna get 50% VPIT positives, okay? And then I'm gonna get, everything is gonna be labyrinth, which is gonna be amazing. So. This snake in and of itself is, is really not, it's kind of like, uh, it's, it's a real powerhouse for, for breeding purposes um, because you can get labby and VPIT positive into everything you breed this thing to. And that's the advantage. So this girl will be staying here. I do have one more 
a sister to this girl. Now this sister, she's got a little more pattern to her. She's not quite as yellow, which is interesting because I'm, I'm trying to figure out what could possibly be different with the sister. She's a VPIT positive crystal as well. I'm wondering if maybe the other one is a super hypo. I don't think so. I don't think that it's, it's possible, I guess. And this one might be one copy hypo. But both are beautiful in their own right. Very interesting patterns. Very pinkish looking. The pink comes from the crystal. Super Labbies are really white and pink colored. VPIT positive is giving it the red eyes because otherwise it would have a blue eye. Crystals, crystal boas, which are super labbies, have blue eyes. And I've shown you my blue-eyed ones before. I can show you again. The VPIT positive takes away just a little bit of melanin from the eye, and it makes it red. So you see the blood vessels behind there. Really cool. Let's look at our other crystal. It has blue eyes. All right, there's our more than likely super hypo possible jungle crystal you can see i took it outside so the light will dilate the pupil a little bit and you'll see that blue blue eye see how blue that eye is that's beautiful and it's more than likely super hypo because you see that the the, uh, the labby pattern has completely been reduced to a fine line down its back and you can see the real whites and pinks in this snake and that's this is a typical Super Hypo Crystal. I'm pretty sure I produced the first Super Hypo Crystal. It's actually in Vin Russo's book, um, The More Complete Boa Constrictor. And you can see how white and pink that was. That was when it was a baby. And it had a really, really blue eye. And you know, some, some labbies have blue eyes too, but this, these crystals have the, the, the most insane, insane blue eyes. And <laughs> she's attacking me. Look at that. What a nice eye. And here's a nice comparison video since we're out here. You can see the, uh, the Super Hypo Crystal is pinkish with white, much more pink. And then look at the VPIT positive Hypo Crystal and she's much whiter, less pink, because the VPIT positive took away some of that red reddish eye versus the blue eye of the crystal. So once again, when you take away melanin, which is what the VPIT positive albino does, you're going to take away some of the melanin all over the body. So you're going to lose some of the pinks, you're going to get more whites, and the eye is going to go from this blue to this reddish it's actually still got a little bit of light blue to it. It's like a reddish blue. It's hard to really see. Let me zoom in. I just don't want to lose the resolution. There you go. You see, there's like almost like a white, like a bluish background to that red eye. It's not a real albino red. Whereas this eye, let's zoom on this, thing. Oop, this one's coming right up to the camera. Yeah. See that nice light blue background right there on that eye? This one has got the nice reddish tinge. So both of these snakes are beautiful in their own right. And I'm so lucky to have both of them. All right, here's my um, Superfire Diamond Boas in their naturalistic enclosure. I got the two in here, I'm showing you them before. I just wanted to show you this one because this one is actually on, a tree, on tree branches. This one's not sitting on a shelf, not sitting on the ground. He actually chose himself to sit perched on a tree branch. And I bet you that's exactly what he would do in the wild like that. Pretty cool. I mean, he could, he could be laying on the ground. He could be laying up here basking. But right now, that's where he wants to be. So I thought that was pretty cool. Just wanted to show you guys that. I love the way these guys are in their naturalistic, like, looking type enclosure. They can go where they want. They can... Pretty much, they have the run of this big cage. And it's just cool to witness Bowen's like doing some kind of naturalistic stuff rather than being in a big cage or full out tub or something like that. Uh, they just, they act differently. It's, you know, too bad I can't keep all my snakes like this, you know, just, I would need like a, a hundred thousand square feet, <laughs> you know, and it would be insane. But that's, 
ultimately I'd love to keep my snakes like that. And maybe down the road I will. Right now I'm into breeding. You know, when you breed, you gotta have, uh, it's gotta be economical. It's gotta be easy to clean. And tubs work out really, really well for that, especially for hatchlings. I mean, hatchlings don't belong in like something like this, but yeah, and then if you're also breeding, you know, you want you want control temperatures and stuff like that. Sometimes these, although these cages are great because the, the snake can, can, can thermoregulate itself depending on where it wants to go. So if it wants heat, it'll be up there on the little shelf. This one, basking right under the uh, radiant heat panel. Or if it doesn't want that much heat, it stays down there. All right, a little Bowens Python update. I told you this Bolin likes to use the tree. I don't know what he's doing. He's going up to the light. I have a light up there. He's like chilling out on, but you can see he loves his tree branch. Uh, he's now he's going up to the light. I'm gonna have to like see if I can turn this, do some artistic camera work here. I don't think you can get him. If I rub him, he'll come down a little bit. Oh, there he is. There he is. There's my boy. Look at that guy. They love to climb these. I, I am building an outdoor enclosure, I'm telling you right now. Well, I'm not building it personally. My friend Chase, who's my outdoor enclosure guy, is building me a Boland's Python enclosure, and he's building me a, a Diamond Python enclosure so that these guys can be outside, have tree branches, and be exposed to the weather. I just have to, we just have to grow our female up a little bigger. The male's ready to go out there, but the female's not, not yet. But you can see they like to, they like to move around. I want to give them the ability to, to do their thing. All right, there's our female Bolins. Slowly but surely growing. I think she's almost got her mature colors now, Pop. She's like uh, gone through that color change. She's pretty, she's pretty black now. When we got her, she still had some like red in her and some brown. Her face, at least the top part of her body has definitely gotten much much blacker and we're gonna keep uh the thing is with these bowlings you can't overfeed them you don't want to get them fat so we're doing it slowly but ultimately i'd like to put her outside with the male in a nice outdoor enclosure but she's not even close to ready to breed yet so there's no rush for her to go out there we'll just keep slow growing her you know she's only about a year and a half old so i would say that probably another year and a half at least before she's you know ready to go outside but once she is man that's going to be cool to watch those guys interacting outside they probably won't even need any external heat i'll probably put some sort of a heat box in there but they probably won't even need it all right there's my russo red hypo sterling that's patternless it's got the russo red pastel line in it look at that red eye no albino there. And I think she's ovulating. Pablo and I think, look at that that bulge right there. I'm pretty sure that's an ovulation and she's sitting on the heat and boas don't like to sit on heat. Um, they haven't eaten, so there's the male. I produced both of these babies myself back in, I think it was 19, was it? No, or two, was this the seven? These are 17s, I think. Yeah, these were 17s. This is the first litter ever produced of Russo Red Pastel Hypo Sterling's. Uh, in the world, and I sold a bunch of them. I didn't have that many of them. I sold, I think, one or two. And this was my best, this was my holdback male, and that was my holdback female. And I'm breeding them now to see if we can produce even redder ones than before. And obviously, we're, I'm still doing what Vin Russo was doing. He was line breeding the reddest to the reddest. And I, I think these are perfect already. I don't think they really, we need to add anything. I'm, I'm doing other things with them to try to get blood and that kind of stuff into it. but. As far as these go, I'm gonna still continue to line breed these to try to bring more and more red out. And I'll show you one of the females that I produced that I think is the reddest one of all that was produced, um, I believe it was a year and a half ago. So let's take a look at that. All right, and that's the, um, this is my holdback female that I produced in, what is this, uh, 20. So she's uh, gonna be, or she is two and a half years old already. She's been slow grown. You can see she's got a really, look at that red tail. That's where you see the red the most, but you can see it. They, you would, I would swear these things have blood in them. They're so red, you know? And we'll eventually breed her to one of our really red males. And I'm just gonna keep line breeding these things. I'll sell the babies, keep the reddest, and 
hopefully at some point just by line breeding we'll have true breeding totally red solid pattern boas and they're real these snakes get big too if you if you like a big boa these things will get big if you feed them uh, they have the genetics to them the, the original mother of everything i'll show you her she's enormous <laughs> All right, guys, that's going to do it for today here at Palumbo's Pythons and Boas. We're working with our uh, Black Dragon. I'm starting to feel out her personality. I see that she does not like gloves. It scares her. She sees it as a threat. Uh, I think I'm going to get brave tomorrow, hopefully, or the next day, and I'm going to start letting her come up and, and investigating my hands, seeing that I'm not trying to hurt her. Hopefully, she won't bite it. And I think once we break the ice and we, we get through that, I think we're going to make some really good progress with her. So I think she's got really good potential to become a really tame animal. And I have, uh, I have confidence that we're going to be able to do it. And I want to thank Sean O'Rourke for continuing to text me and give me ideas and uh, techniques because uh, that really helps when someone has experience that, that helps you guys, that, that helps you out. And you know, I try to put out the information he's given me because, you know what, water monitors can be great pets, man. It's like, it's like the dog of the reptile world, and they're so smart. I just love working with them. And as you know, I love working with the boas too. So if you guys like what you're seeing, you know what to do. Hit that subscribe button. Turn on those notifications. Hit that like button. I'll see you back tomorrow. We're going up to underground reptiles, and I'm going to have a video from there, hopefully in the next couple days. Stay tuned.